So I think this might be the last talk I ever give. I've been asked to give away all the secrets of vascular surgery to interventional nephrology. When, va <laughs> when the Vascular Society catches up with me, I am dead. So anyway, here we go. How to create a fistula when all the ideal options are gone. So the first thing when you see the patient is you need to think, am I doing the right thing here? Just because they're referred into your office for a fistula doesn't mean it's the right option for them. You need to start thinking laterally when things become difficult. You need to think about peritoneal dialysis, which is underused in my opinion. You need to think about, can this patient be transplanted? Talk to them about possible live donors and so on. And then finally look at the patient. Are they old, limited life expectancy? You're probably going to get them into a situation where they're going to have surgery, possible, possibly multiple interventions to get something to work. Maybe they might be better off with the line. I know it's sacrilege and we've been talking about it, but for some patients where things become very difficult, it is the correct option for them. So what do you need to know? You need to know the history of what's happened. What failed attempts have they had and try and work out why it's failed. You need to work out if there's an underlying diagnosis here. Have they got peripheral vascular disease? Have they presented with fingertips dead? Low flow fistulas that won't mature? Maybe they're lupus patients with lupus anticoagulant. They've had PEs, DVTs before. And you need to consider afterwards whether you're going to need to give antiplatelets or anticoagulation for them. You need to understand their anatomy completely in order to have a chance where everybody else has failed. You need to know the state of the veins of all four limbs all the way back to the heart. And the way to do that is you're going to need to image the central veins of the chest, the iliacs, and the IVC. And there are a number of ways you can do it, which I'll go through later. And you're going to need to know the state of the veins and the arteries going all the way uh, to the end of each limb. Duplex is the best way to do this, and I suggest if you're going to do this type of work that you do learn to do it yourself. A report cannot convey the details of how deep the vein is, how close it physically looks, how easy does this look. When you're experienced at creating fistulas, you know by the scan how difficult something's going to be. So in our unit for the pre-dialysis population uh, for central veins, we use MR venograms. Um, and in the dialysis cohort, we use um, CT venograms generally with reconstruction. Uh, we have duplex, duplex scanners are ubiquitous and they should be here uh, too. We have them in every clinic room, we have them in theatres. Um, and I would suggest you shouldn't embark on any AV uh, procedure uh, without scanning them if that's an option. Uh, it's an angiogra um, DSA angiogram for mapping which we don't use anymore except for the central veins occasionally. So you also need to know about the inflow vessels, the arteries. Um, despite some proficiency in scanning, I still think feeling a pulse is the best way of telling whether your access is likely to work or not. Um, you can do ultrasound measurements of diameters and pulse waves, which I do just to show that I can do it, but actually the pulse is what I'm really going on, but don't tell anybody. We'd, if your unit is recording blood pressures pre and post dialysis, this is vital information to know. The, the one you're interested, of course, is the post dialysis blood pressure, which is often, often under uh, 100 uh, millimeters of mercury, particularly in anephric patients. Uh, and that's going to portend a poor outcome if you're using uh, conduit which has got high resistance. If there's any suggestion that the ejection fraction may be a problem in your patient, then you should do an echo as well. Although I don't have, people are probably going to stand up and ask me what my cutoff in ejection fraction is. I don't have one, but it will influence what I do. And then once you've collected that information together, compartmentalize in your mind what the actual problem is that's facing you. Is this an inflow problem with the arteries? Is this a central venous stenosis or occlusion? Or is there a pacemaker in the way? Um, or is it a problem with the conduit? Is there just no suitable vein you can use? Or is it none of the above? And you've hit the jackpot if it's none of the above because you're going to be able to solve it. It's either going to be the surgery is done poorly, an option has been missed, or they've got a thrombophilia which you should be able to overcome. So, inflow problems, I would advise you to avoid uh, limbs without pulses like the plague. You will cause tissue loss if you start making fistulas generally. Uh, I wouldn't take the risk personally. 
The other thing to be wary of is if you have a diabetic with peripheral vascular disease who needs to be wheeled into your clinic because they've already lost limbs uh, and they've got a failed radiocephalic. Just be careful about moving up the limb into big diameter uh, brachiocephalic fistulas because steel is a strong possibility. You may get away with it. It may just be a bit of coldness, a bit of pain on dialysis, but you may get tissue loss. Some people have described doing um, angioplasties to prepare people for AV fistulas. I've never done that personally, but I certainly have used angioplasties where steel has happened and there was a proximal problem. We've, we've angioplastied subclavian arteries before uh, and even brachial arteries, but we probably wouldn't in our unit go down into the forearm vessels. This is what happens if you do a brachiocephalic fistula with occlusive disease. And, and you ignore the, the pain, the person coming in with something that looks like carpal tunnel syndrome, and then the little sore on the end of their finger, oh, that should be fine, we'll just come back next week, and that's what it looks like when they come back next week. Now, upper central vein uh, occlusion. Um, I, again, you want to avoid this, but you know, there's a bit of leeway here. Um, I would avoid, if possible, an occluded uh, central vein or something with a pacemaker because it's quite predictable that that will progress on to an occlusion. And a stenosis, I, I, I consider a relative contraindication. So I have made low, lowish flow radiocephalic fistulas knowing there's a central venous stenosis ipsilaterally. And I deliberately haven't sent them for plasty for fear of sparking off aggressive restenosis. And often you can get away with it. The patient will notice their hands a bit swollen. If you warn them before, they're often tolerant of it. If you explain, there's nothing else really to do. Uh, this is all about patient education and expectations. If you're going to make suboptimal accesses, which is what we're talking about, you might get away with a brachiocephalic fistula, but often you'll end up with, with um, limb swelling, which is going to require central venous plasties. My colleagues, have on occasions reopened central veins in order to form access. And I would advise you not to do this because it's predictable even before the things mature, you're going to be going in there, plastying it and plastying it again, and then persuading the, the patient to have that cannulated after, they've, after it's been swollen is going to be a nightmare for them and for you. And whatever you do, and I've done this once, I confess, I've made a transposed brachial basilic fistula in someone who I did the first stage on, and their arm became swollen, and I did a central venous plasty, and then I superficialized it. And I will never do that again. It, became, it recurred, of course. The arm became edematous, the wound started to fall apart, uh, fluid coming out of it, and we had to ligate it. She ended up with a long-term wound infection. We had to do plasties just to get the wound to heal, even without a fistula running. We spoke about the hero graft and the surfacer, and that, that can be an option of last resort in these cases. And there's a picture we've seen already this morning. Uh, this is a picture of one I, I put in. The indication here is, hey, okay, can I not aim? Okay. Anyway, the indication here, uh, he's got uh, an implantable defibrillator, which is occluded the right side. Here's your, here's your lumbar catheter coming up from below. Um, and he had a failed radiocephalic, so we went ahead and put a hero in. And he, that actually worked, but he did get a mild degree of swelling, and he did get some steel, and it's been, uh, it's been unpleasant for him, really, to have that cannulated. And, and he's actually asked to withdraw from dialysis, so I'm considering putting this back in again and closing that off. We're going to have that discussion next week. Uh, you can do the same thing with a Gore hybrid graft as you can with a hero. Possibly there's an advantage because the thing doesn't cross into the SVC. You can just treat one central vein instead of uh, putting it down the common channel of the SVC. That lasted less than six months before it needed a declot. Uh, we've all seen these pictures before. This is a brachiocephalic fistula with central venous occlusion, uh, and you get gross arm swelling. It go, you can't be cannulated. If you were to cannulate this, it's a sitting duck for an infection, uh, and, then, and then you've got even more problems. So he, here's the perfect thing that you might find. The inflow and the central veins are okay. You know, you're in with a chance here. 
First thing to think about, has, it, has anybody missed a standard fistula? And the main ones that, I, that are often missed are the mid-forearm radiocephalic, which has been discussed today, going back down the arm. It seems counterintuitive for people, but it, it can be done. If you're careful about the runoff still being intact, you can go backwards down the arm. Or if someone's failed with a brachiocephalic or a brachiobasilic, you, they may have used the median cubital, and you may be able to find the common, uh, the common stem further down and use that. So here's my little diagram, your mid-forearm fistula. The only technical difficulty with this is the artery is a bit deeper. And, and often it, the brachioradialis tendon impinges on it. I, I have no qualms about incising half the brachioradialis tendon just to make sure it doesn't impinge. And it doesn't seem to lead to any problems. This, this seems like magic to our nephrologists, but is not that difficult to do. Uh, here's someone's used a, a brachio, has done a brachiocephalic, it's, it's gone. Uh, but often when you look down the arm, and Charmaine knows this, this vein is still there. And often the runoff up the, up the basilic vein is still there. So as long as the person making the fistula hasn't gone down here, the cephalic vein will still have runoff. And some people will avoid cephalic veins of around two millimeters because they just want to do one operation that works. And you know, you can understand that. The pa it's difficult to explain to the patient, I'm gonna make you a fistula, it might work, it might not, or here's a winner. Would you like this one? It'll pretty much definitely work. And many patients will opt for that. And, it, and it's, it's attractive for the surgeon as well, but when that fails, it can be possible to come back down the arm. Uh, and, and this is something I see a lot. Uh, first stage uh, transposition fistulas made with the median cubital vein, that thrombosis, it's not the end of the world, you can just pick up the basilic vein further down and swing it across and do that. And often this is a much bigger vein than the median cubital, so you've got a good chance. The only thing is that you'll need to use a, uh, sorry not a lateral, a medial approach to the vessels uh, and go below the, inc the uh, antecubital fossa incision. Uh, so less standard options, uh, and I'm sure many people have done this, you can make fistulas with the, with the deep veins, with the brachial veins. Um, they are, uh, they nearly always mature, but they're difficult to transpose because they're short and they're deep. And if you're unlucky, it will flick from one side. The dominant vein will, there's always two brachial veins, nearly always two brachial veins. And sometimes it switches dominance halfway up the arm. So it'll go up the, up the medial side and then flick across to the lateral and back to the medial. And it, and it can be awkward to dissect this thing out. And you end up with a vein which has got right angle bends in it, which is not ideal. But you know, it, in some people it can be the right option. And interestingly, you don't seem to get venous hypertension even when the basilic vein is gone and the cephalic vein is gone and you, and you ligate one of the brachial veins and bring the other one up as a fistula, still the arm doesn't get swollen. I don't totally understand why that is, but it's an observation. You can consider ulnar or basilic vein loops or transpositions. I've only made a handful of those actually, but they're more common in the US and uh, Tushar showed us some nice pictures of them uh, or an AV graft. And really at this point, personally, I'd be going for an AV graft. Um, so there's an ulnar vein, and in fact, you showed some nice photographs of it, so there's no need to labor this. Um, if there are no uh, suitable con venous conduits, then you're going to be looking at a PTFE graft. And I, as a standard, I use an early stick graft. I, I put gore accuracy in all the time. I used to use Flixine. It went off the market for a bit, switched to gore, and I've stuck with that. Um, with graft, you have to be careful of hypotension. They need good driving pressures. You need to be aware that when you do get that high flow through it, steel is a possibility. And they don't do well in people uh, with thrombophilia. Um, I've made forearm loops. Uh, you can either, you can put the venous outflow either to the basilic or the brachial veins, uh, both options. In my hands, it's inferior to a straight uh, graft. I find it difficult to get, keep these things running beyond a year or two. Um, straight brachial auxiliary is what I put in as standard, uh, either up to the um, basilic vein if it's just, so some basilic veins are very small, lower in the arm, they get bigger, higher up, and then they're, they're suitable to do the runoff to, or I go on to the deep veins. Uh, occasion, I've made occasional loop upper arm fistulas uh, for uh, 
people who've got very small vessels at the antecubital fossa, uh, where I think there's no real chance of it driving a graft. Uh, and of course, the necklace graft, which uh, one of my colleagues in St. George's uh, in London prefers, and he's published extensively on it. I'll show you some. So uh, forearm uh, loop graft. Uh, of course, these are radiology pictures, so these are all things that have failed, so it tells you about grafts. Um, straight radio basilic. I didn't mention it, but I sometimes use this in radiocephalics, uh, which have got mid-forearm stenosis. Uh, if the... Uh, most people don't take graft inflow from the radial artery, but you can do it if it's been driving a fistula before. Uh, Brachio auxiliary graft is the standard one. This one I've just uh, extended to the uh, subclavian vein because there was an auxiliary vein stenosis, so I've jumped past it, but otherwise that's a standard one. Uh, an upper arm loop. This was a lady with lupus, uh, lupus anticoagulant, high bifurcation of the brachial artery. Uh, and uh, we went ahead and made this loop graft. It uh, thrombosed on average every four months. Uh, eventually she got fed up of it and just said leave it and she's back on the line now but for a while we thought we were winning. Uh, this is a necklace graft and it, this is quite a nice picture because here's the indication, isn't it? Look at all the collaterals here. So this vein is open and this artery is open. So we've just gone from one side of the neck to the other. Now, ladies don't really like this because you're going to cannulate up on the neck, but for a gentleman, uh, it's, a, it's an option that's there. It's not high on your list of options, but, but you can do it, particularly if you're, if you're doing a bit of vascular surgery and you're used to doing the top end of an axillo uh, bifemoral graft. It's exactly the same dissection. Um, so if there's no attractive options in the arm, move to the leg. Um, the, uh, in the... In the leg, you're talking about PTFE grafts predominantly. Um, and my preference is actually to put a straight uh, or J-shaped PTFE. You can do saphenous vein, tra saphenous vein loops or transpositions. Well described. I've tried it a couple of times, didn't have great results, decided not to do it again. Uh, and we've done a few superficial femoral vein transpositions, which is heroic surgery, uh, followed by heroic complications, but also long-term patency. It stays patent for ages, a, a femoral, um, femoral vein transposition. I'm not talking about the saphenous vein, I'm talking about the deep vein of the leg here. Now, uh, my first choice here, so when I started out, I used to make loops. And as we discussed before, the neo hyperplasia happens up here, which is inaccessible underneath the inguinal ligament. Uh, so it's very difficult to revise that proximally. So I changed. And now I put them in like a J configuration. That's quite accessible, actually, particularly if you mark it with ultrasound. You can just split the uh, sartorius muscle away, and it's sitting looking at you. And then if this goes down at the venous end, of course you can angioplasty it. But when you're, when you're sick of angioplasting it, you can bring it to here or to here, or you just keep moving up the leg if you need to. So this is a straight uh, early stick AV graft uh, in a lady with mixed connective tissue disorder, has been on lines for, she was on lines for about 20 years. Uh, although they're called early stick grafts, I tend to let them settle in if, there's, if it's possible. Even though they're early stick, they still get hematomas around them if they're not handled perfectly. So normally I leave it a couple of weeks before we cannulate this, but you can, we've cannulated from the recovery bay uh, on occasions. Uh, this is your standard loop, you've all seen that standard loop thigh graft. Um, and then the vein is second choice. Like I said, I don't really do the long saphenous vein transposition. In the literature, it's got poor outcomes, and in my hands, it's got poor outcomes. Uh, but what we have done in younger patients who are really running out of everything, we have done a few uh, superficial femoral vein uh, transpositions. I'll just say a word on that because it's not frequently performed. Uh, but what you're going to do is make a long incision down the, down the medial side of the leg, uh, all the way down to the popliteal fossa. You're going to dissect the deep vein throughout its full length, so you've got the whole leg skeletonized. You divide the vein down at the popliteal vein. I can all hear you saying, oh, venous outflow problem. Yes, true, it happens. And then you tunnel it back round and anastomose it to the femoral artery. Oh my God, it's high flow, it's gonna cause steel. Yes, it does. Uh, so I'll show you a picture of uh, 
of the complications thereof. Now, this, is, this, this loop, uh, sorry, this femoral vein transposition has been running for seven years now, but it's required some work. This is an inflow reduction. We had to band it because it was running at about six liters per minute. Um, and then it developed a stenosis where we banded it, of course. So we've been angioplasting that. The other thing is, presumably because of the huge shear force in it, the iliac vein occluded above it. And we angioplasted it a few times. And if you can see that, there's now a stent. We've had to stent that open to keep it open. So, and the other thing is, these people get edematous legs, they get wound healing problems, and they get claudication. However, if you set that against a young patient who accepts that that's going to happen, and they want a long-term access, maybe for a very select few people, it's a reasonable thing to do. Uh, I, I'm not totally convinced. That kind of goes into desperate measures. It probably belongs on this slide, but here's more desperate measures. Uh, I've gone from the left common iliac artery right across the abdominal wall into the IVC for occluded iliac veins bilaterally. This is like your surgical lumbar line, I suppose. Um, I've taken a leg loop off a bypass graft, which everyone said was insane because of the risk of infection, and got away with it, but I, that's one for one, like I was saying, too sure never again. We'll just accept that. <laughs> um, I've done forearm uh, loops in the presence of central occlusions and gotten away with it. Uh, I've put in a couple of hero grafts for a current central occlusion. Uh, this should be at the top of the slide, really. Uh, I, if you, can, if you can get your patient to transplant and, and make the problem go away for a decade, then that's the thing to do. We have a way in the UK of prioritizing these patients. So we have a thing called fast track kidneys. They're marginal uh, kidneys from older donors, often non-heart beating donors. And if they're offered and they're declined by the first recipient, we're generally allowed to just use them for people where we see fit. And if we have people who are really failing access in desperate trouble, we'll sometimes put a fairly marginal kidney into them just because they don't have much time left to wait. And what I haven't told you is all the procedures on the scrap heap, all the things I've tried and failed. But that's another talk. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Coleman. Uh, very lucid presentation. I'm giving the heroic approach when all the options are exhausted. But in the earlier part of the presentation, you gave one part as an echocardiography for evaluating before going for an AV fistula. So you do have any cutoff point where if the patient ejection fraction is less than... You so I said I don't have a cutoff point when I, when, I made the, when I said it. I think it would temper your enthusiasm for making a high flow access. It would temper it. Um, we all know that ejection fraction in dialysis patients varies with their volume status. And, and echo one day looks very different to the echo uh, the next day. So you can't be absolute about this. But certainly it would, you know, you get someone with an ejection fraction sub 20 and you start putting big accesses in. It's probably not the right thing to do, particularly if they're older. Their survival is probably not going to be that good if they're in that situation. Maybe a line is the right thing for someone like that. Or PD, actually. PD would be a good option for somebody like that if, it's, if, if their peritoneum is okay. Good morning, sir. Any come? Chronic kidney disease patients, most of them have atrial fibrillation or ventricular premature beats. So you are concentrating on pulse. In this irregular pulse, uh, what will be the effect on the a graft failure or a AV fistula failure? It doesn't, it doesn't affect my decision making. We've all felt, uh, we, you make fistulas and, and then it stops, you know. The, I think the thing that the, the mean blood pressure is probably a better thing to go on rather than the atrial fibrillation. Um, I'd, it doesn't really make a huge difference to my decision making. If I feel that the, the driving force is enough, I'll go ahead and make an access in them. Sir, you said that PTFE is your preferred material. What's the other material that you have used and what's the advantage over other for PTFE? 
No, what I'm saying is, rather, if there's no vein available, uh, or in the leg, if it's or in the leg particularly, I will go for graft rather than vein, like the opposite way around in arms. Really, that's what I was saying. But we don't use Dacron or any. I, I, yeah. You did mention that uh, he would not uh, open a central vein. Uh, yeah. Just to make a fistula. Yeah. On the other hand, somebody who's already had a failing fistula must have had multiple interventions with catheters also. So we, especially if you're making a brachial fistula, you often find, uh, often. you know, venous hypertension, swelling of the hand, uh, post that. And I've found that in good hands, uh, with a good interventionist, you can open up quite well, you know, with good results. Uh, you can, a, you can, but recurrence is the rule rather than the exception. So. There's a thing about how many procedures you're willing to, to do on a patient as well. So you, you make a fistula, and if you're already having to intervene before you've even used it, then, you know, is, is that really the right thing to do? And, you're, and it, it, it's unpleasant to have a swollen arm like that. The no, patients hate it. Just somebody who and it's like, just tie this thing off. Get rid of it. I, I don't want it anymore. I'm fed up having... Sent. So I wouldn't start off the life of the fistula with, it, with the end already in sight. Okay. That's, that's my own you, view. That's you, provided if you have another option. Usually there is something that can be done. And in, in those patients, I would say that maybe a line is not the worst thing ever in someone who, is, who you're otherwise going to give quite debilita debilitating symptoms to. Uh, and, and there's the legs. Uh, you know, and there's lumbar. There, there are many more in PD. And tra there are many more op options rather than that. That would be low down on my list of things uh, to do. Uh, as I said in my talk, I've done it before. I've made radiocephalix and brachiocephalix knowing there was a stenosis there, hoping the swelling wouldn't be too bad in someone who's desperate. But they have to know that this is, you know. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. The second thing is, what's your opinion on uh, where every nothing else is working? Uh, what's your opinion on arterial, arterial AV graft? I've never done one. I, there, there are publications describing it. Um, one assumes the venous pressures must be enormous in such a conduit because the venous needle is going into a, into a tissue bed, you know, and the potential for embolization in distally is high. But there are series of it. I, particularly, there's one, uh, there's a, somebody in Egypt, I think it was, who's published quite a big series on them. No, I've, I've had experience with one. Yeah, yeah. This wasn't about an 80 old year old guy. Yeah. Uh, do you ligate the artery in between the loop to, to send? So, oh, I, so I personally didn't do it myself. It was my the vascular surgeon who did it. Presumably, when you put the loop in, you need to ligate the section in the middle to make the flow go around the loop. And then you've got your whole limb depending on this yes, access circuit. You have to be really desperate to be going down, down uh, that I'm route. Sorry for the interruption, Mr. Chairman. That's all that we have time for this presentation. Uh, Mr. Foreman would continue with his next lecture for 20 minutes on surgical options to treat aneurysms, pseudoaneurysms, and ABF. Mr. Foreman, please.